and you'll see in the PowerPoint his restarting graph or chart. It'll be hard to read, but when you get the PDF, you'll be able to, you know, see it in more depth. Um, today's session, um, my goal was to also have uh, Bernie McDermott on from the Berkshire Arc to talk about what it's been like for her as someone who oversees staff at a home and the experience of quarantine and the experience that they've had. I, I want to I say something um, that I think we've tried to emphasize because we've advocated around the healthcare issue, but I think we might not have, you know, in retrospect, encouraged enough. And I think all the staff that are involved, they're, they're not just supporting people and giving care and trying to help them have productive lives during this extended, you know, I don't know what to call extended stay in place period, right? Um, they also, for people who can't speak for themselves and identify their concerns, they're advocates for them too. Because we know that the healthcare issue isn't just in hospitals, it's sometimes in our communities with PCPs and with other people working in the medical field that might not appreciate that just because someone's not verbally able to share what's wrong with them, that in fact, people who can see between the lines, you know from behavior or feelings, um, or sense things when there's, you know, coughing and, you know, as long as any of the symptoms are there, uh, especially if someone's been tested and found to be positive, you know, people also end up wearing the hat advocate. And, and I know they're used to doing that. It's, I also know they've been working really hard. And I know how hard that is when you are working hard and you're feeling depleted. Um, to also then advocate against people in I don't know, maybe sometimes doctors are perceived as more powerful positions, it's hard to do. So I just want to encourage everybody and thank everybody, the staff that have been out there on the front lines and families where obviously we recognize families and people with disabilities who've been helping as well through the crisis, um, which there have been a lot. So um, obviously it's, it's been a long process and we're not done. And you'll see with the chart, we're not done yet for sure. Um, well, let's go on, let's go on with the slides. Uh, this, this week, I didn't do a comparison for the two weeks, but I can tell you looking at the numbers, it's still, an, and as we know from TV, it's, we're not on the downwards trend as we'd like to be, but we clearly are growing much slower than before. And um, the number of cases rose by 7,000. If you recall, last week, the number of people who died was under 1,000, but it was above 900. This week, it's barely below 900. So there's some movement there, it's slow. Darn it, it's, it's slower than we'd like. Um, and so this is, you know, it's basically a situation where we're flat, um, pretty flat, but the, the conditions out there. And then in our world, I don't have a new chart for our world in terms of our, when I say our world, obviously it doesn't cover everybody, it only covers those in the DDS residential network of 10,000 or so people. Um, and in, in that world of residential care, residential support, homes and apartments, and I, including shared living and the like, um, I don't have updated numbers. I looked, I've been getting them from Representative Josh Cutler and he did not have it over the weekend. So um, we have no sense of how that's going. What we do know is we still have a lot of COVID virus. And so it's really, still out there in the homes. And it's, you know, for us that can't do anything about it, it's about prayer and keeping people in our thoughts and, and keeping staff knowing they're appreciated that are working the front lines and of course families as well. Um, today, the governor defined reopening and I'm gonna show you that in a minute. Um, he talked about the protective behavior uh, must continue. Uh, he talked about that on Friday. Um, some of you watched the Sunday news, I was sort of shocked, a woman demonstrating in Cape Cod, a uh, middle-aged woman called the virus a fake virus. And uh, I, to me, that's not even news. Like I really question why, like you, you know, it'd be sort of like having, you know, I, I don't want to quantify it, even be judgmental about it, but I do feel judgmental about her behavior, but I'd rather judge the news for even presenting that. You could just say, hey, there's still small groups in Massachusetts they are, you know, trying to push for quicker reopening. And uh, I, any of you that heard him today is clearly very wise in the way he presents it. Um, 
And we put out something over the weekend, uh, actually with notes from the ARC about how reopening will take several steps. And if we do have time today, we'll have a dialogue about that. But I obviously, um, and like last week, I want to have a dialogue with you, but I'm looking forward to having Brittany on and talking about, you know, what her experience has been like. Um, and then we'll talk more about that later in the in the call. Here's the chart. Can you, I think the chart's small and I apologize with that. I didn't have, I literally got it this morning. Didn't have enough time to blow it up the way I prefer break it in two. But the governor said each of these phases will be approximately three weeks. And sometimes it might be more than three weeks, okay? So, and why would they be more than three weeks? Because of those numbers we were looking at, right? A few slides ago. If suddenly they start seeing a thousand cases um, or more cases of the virus growing than were this month, I'm sure they're gonna extend the time period for a phase. So phase one starts this week. Given the you know, thing about three weeks, you can do the arithmetic. Uh, we're into June, right? Before phase two begins. There's gonna be guidance. The, the guidance basically um, wants, oh, and you can see May 25th, lab space, office space, limited personal services here, pet grooming, car washes, uh, remote fulfillment, outside curb pickup. Oops, sorry. You know, those are all going to happen over the next two weeks into July 1st. Um, phase two, which will be again three weeks from now, you're looking at some capacity limitations. I mean, I know they talked about places of worship being only 40% full. Um, I don't know if anyone else heard that. That's what I heard. So that's going to be an impact. Uh, but with the good news with worship, I mean, they could, people wanted to, they could offer more than one time for a service. Um, and then we're looking at, I'm having, I got to move these things so I can see the chart. Um, by the time phase four comes, there's a full resumption of activity in the new normal. And I got a feeling the new normal, they don't know what that'll be. You know, to what extent will we have these protective recommendations? What will be going on, you know, in terms of those? Clearly, phase three, uh, when you open bars and when you open um, other kinds of, you know, locations like casinos, fitness gyms. I'm, I mean, I'm personally wish. Hello. Hi. I personally wish the fitness gym would open earlier. And, you know, but that's life. <laughs> and there is a lot of proximity in a gym. Um, so we're looking at that potentially six weeks uh, from May 18th uh, into July before that happens. Um, museums and the like. Um, and then they're holding off on nightclubs um, and large venues until phase four. So that's, that's you know, that's a bit up to date. Now, what, what you should know, um, in addition to the small groups that were you know, demonstrating to make things open quicker. <clears throat> um, there are groups, uh, the healthcare coalition that we have been part of that wants to open things slower. So there is a lot of fear that we're not on the downward trend. And he's trying to maintain this balance. And I think especially because of the economy, his concerns, the governor. Um, I want to touch on um, just something on the federal piece here before uh, I check in with Brittany. And uh, basically pretty exciting Friday night, the House did pass the HEROES Act, $3 trillion stimulus. It includes a couple of big things for us. Um, and that's federal matching monies for Medicaid as a whole to go up to 10% effective um, July 1st. I'm sorry, 14%. I should be looking at my paper, which is right here. Wrote it last night for the update. Um, and the other, the other piece of news, really good news, is the home and community-based services is triggered to go up as well. There's a whole bunch of obvious, of really good things um, in this package. Um, and home and community-based services, um, 
you know, 14%. So we're looking at significant investment. Now, here's, here's what's going to happen. There's also additional monies for state and municipalities. Municipalities are struggling, not just the state budget. And California just announced a major reduction in funding uh, of billions of dollars. Uh, I'm sure that's just the beginning gambit. We're going to be facing that. But this money from the feds is really important. But the Senate leaders have said it's dead on arrival, that they don't want to do anything this significant. On May 13th, though, which was only days ago, when it's last Wednesday, the Federal Reserve Chief Powell, I think, um, basically said we need something big to avoid the long-term Im impact of a major recession. And I use the word recession instead of the D word, depression, because depression is pretty scary. But here's a conservative Federal Reserve chief saying, no, we do need something big. That even though it's probably not affordable, affordability is an issue, that if we don't do that, the long-term implications are going to be really bad for our economy. So the question is, what will happen in D.C., the resistance, the partisanship, can we get past that? And, and can we have a significant deal? And there's things for adult caregivers there that go beyond the parents. There's dependent support, things like that, that are really vital to get past. So, uh, Brittany, are you on? Brittany? Can you tell Carrie? She's probably yeah, um, I've been looking for her. I don't see her. There okay. is someone on the phone, though, and I unmuted them, uh, but uh, I'm not, if she's not answering. Okay, so, you know. So, we'll, I mean, you did get a lot of questions, yeah. uh, so. Right, well, let, me, let, wanna... me, let me touch on this really quick, and the reason I was okay. looking forward to having her on is across the state. Uh, and I have some colleagues on, so I might put Mike Maloney on the spot for a couple of minutes. But I, I know that basically people have been- Hello. Hi, is this Brittany? No, okay. Hello. Okay, hi. So basically uh, people have been embedded in homes sometimes for weeks to make sure the virus doesn't expand in a given home. And this was in an article where Ken Singer had talked about a home where there had been some virus and people were able to keep it to the place where it was able to go off quarantine after a couple of weeks. And Brittany was the supervisor of that site. And she said, you know, none of this is easy, but it can be easy when you know how to work together like this team does. Um, so I, I think that's why I wanted to make sure we had a chance to talk about what it's like, the lived experience. And um, but go ahead with the questions and then we could, if we want, we can put someone on the spot that's on the call, uh, like Mike. <laughs> okay, so there's uh, um, some questions about the reopening and uh -huh. especially, um, you know, when one question was, we, we haven't heard anything yet. What about extended school year programs, including summer scale, school? Right. Um, yeah. So in the update, so, so on purpose, I sent something out, I think Thursday and and um, so right now in the day program side, the trade association, which is called ADDP, it's coming together. It's, uh, there's a group of folks meeting, including the entire executive committee of the organization um, with the day and employment committee to talk about best practices as people reopen. Um, one of the really key things on this issue, um, if you think about it, it's not just what the governor announced that we're going to reopen. It's also when, when the commissioner of public health, um, they lift the order closing the schools and closing the day programs. Each location, each school district, each um, placement site, if it's not within the school district, let's say it's a private day school or a private residential, uh, uh, I'm sorry, private day school or a collaborative program, they're going to need to have enough PPE, protective equipment on hand you're going to need to figure out their space. And, and the biggest barrier that I see for all these places is budget. Um, how much money will there be for day and employment programs? You know, I just shared with you that California already announced for the 21 budget some cuts um, in terms of what it had originally intended to do. And what's going to happen for our state? And I think, you know, we, we shouldn't just silently accept the cuts. We're going to need to advocate um, 
together because so, some of the cuts may be unavoidable. Um, and I know anybody listening to me, you know, if the legislators listen to me saying, what do you mean may be unavoidable, you know? But I think that's until we really see the full scope of the issue and look at all the ways to solve it. But in terms of having more funding for PPE, more funding to deal, deal with space, let me give you another example. How about transportation? How many people are in a school vehicle when they go to their classes? How many people are in a day program vehicle? Sometimes six, right? Five sitting very close to each other. How's that gonna work with controlling the virus? So these are the things that the group's meeting with. And I think um, it's really important. Any, I, does that get to, you know, I think we won't know minimum for a few more weeks, just in terms of what people are thinking. And then of course, these organizations that are planning, they're wondering how much funding will we have? Because as we reported last week, I think we reported last week, if not, we found out after Monday, we reported, um, that 50% of the money was made available for day programs versus a commitment for 80% because of problems with federal reimbursement from Washington. So that means all these programs had been expecting 80%, those running really intense programs, now we're looking at laying people off and the like because of the 30% difference. Um, so if we didn't have a chance to know that during the webinar, we found out shortly thereafter and published it on the site, but it's, it's yet another barrier and I would think schools are facing the same kind of questions, even though their budgeting practice is different. Um, they're, they're ahead of day programs and whatever, because you know, there's certain basic things about schools that are gonna operate no matter what, but they may have staffing issues, there might have to be furloughs. We, we don't know what implications will happen there. How can you plan if you don't know what your capacity is? Okay, thanks, Leo. Um, a couple questions <clears throat> um, in terms of uh, they have openings. Um, and then Kathy just heard that she's hearing that about people attending day haves on alternate days and or half days. Can you comment on that? Yeah, I mean, um, I think that's the question is, that's what people are thinking about. So like, remember when you would have, um, uh, what do you call it? When I went to a really big high school. I don't know if anybody else did. We had 5,000 people, all right? We had three school periods, but you know, some of that time we were in the building together. In this case, maybe it'd be a shorter day, four hour day, and there'd be two, what do you call it? Shifts in terms of people coming in. I'm just making that up right now. This has been, this is all conjecture. So, you know, if you have sort of, it's common sense kind of conjecture, but we won't know for sure what'll happen, what'll make the most sense. And then the question becomes, you know, will people be home? Uh, for those people that need someone living with them, how will that impact the home situation? Um, so that's that's a real issue. Go ahead, uh, Carrie. Okay, and uh, Alice was wondering if, if a supported employment day program participant works um, in an essential business, what are the implications to return to work? Well, some of them were working through the whole process. I know probably some were not, but if you did not feel comfortable, um, I, I have a friend whose son she was worried about and did not keep, you know, ask for him not to continue at his business because of the whole idea of washing hands every hour, just the concern that keeping up the um, rhythm, you know, of what was needed to do. Um, so I think assuming the jobs are there, which I know in some cases the jobs will be there, um, in other cases, the jobs might not be there, so it's starting all over. So one of the questions on that around is transportation. Should the person be even coming to a day program site? Is there ways to figure out, you know, if you people were paid for mileage, family members, could they temporarily in the new normal um, drive person to the job site? So those are some of the, that's like a con very concrete question related to support and employment and, and concrete ideas that are being considered. And this is all considered, remember, I'm, I'm anecdotal, you know, talking to people and, and what's going on and what are they thinking, as well as the chapter meetings that we have. Okay, thanks, Leo. Uh, Jossie was wondering, um, there's a mention of 10 million for DD act activities. What does that refer to? You mean on the HEROES Act, Jossie, right? Yeah, yeah um, the HEROES Act. Yeah, yeah, so there's a bunch of, 
So there's three, three pots of money, right, in the HEROES Act. One is what I led with, which was the federal reimbursement money, which amounts to, you know, probably nationally billions of dollars. But then there's caregiver support, right, or additional unemployment and caregiver support, things like that. And then there's, you'll see stuff, uh, I think there's some additional money for the Autism Act, additional money for the DD Act, additional money for the administration on um, community living, I guess it's called now, which covers senior citizens and persons with disabilities. Um, and these are going to be all investments, um, you know, in some cases to help with PPE, in some cases to extend the programs, pilot programs. So um, for the university centers to do research, for the law centers maybe to do better monitoring, more monitoring. They do good monitoring. I didn't mean better quality monitoring, but more of it. Um, and so my hunch is it's distributor across the three sectors. Um, but that was a surprise to me, you know, having that in there. But I would assume people were advocating, saying, hey, look, we need to do more during this crisis. So like for like the DD Act, for instance, I know the Disability Law Center falls under the DD Act. Yep. That, they would get more money or something like that or? Right, so the, the NDR, National Disability Rights Network, which is Disability okay. Law Center is part of, I see. you know, that's the whole point, like the monitoring they do in the state. I see, okay. Right, so they could do more of it, you know, right right now. I mean, a lot of that's focused I think, mainly on one staff, maybe a second staff person too, a little bit, but it's not like they have unlimited resources. And the DD Council might get tagged to do some money around um, supporting agencies with pilot activities for the new normal. I'm making this up, but these are okay. the kinds of things I would expect the money was about. And then the university centers, right, such as the two we have, Hmm. at UMass and um, the UMass Driver Center and the Institute, on, uh, um, I always, uh, I should never mix this up, Institute on Community Inclusion. There's an Institute on Community Integration in Minnesota, so I, I fudge it up sometimes, but um, they might get money for research, you know, to see, um, look into things. So it's, awesome. yeah, nice. so those are, that would be, the, now again, will that, will any of this pass through the Senate we don't know. We don't know. Um, so that's a real concern, you know. Um, okay. Um, so Leo uh, Barbro has a concern that her son works at a farm, and you know she really has no idea how that's going to work with teams and crew chiefs to support them. Right. Well, I mean, what I like about a firm is, I guess, in, in this case, would be a little more space between people, depending on how they do it, right? So I would think, you know, versus being in a CDS and, or a Walgreens, I'll try not to be business specific here, um, where you're in a narrower space. I mean, I mean, my wife walked in to buy something yesterday, and she said, I can't believe I went in there. It was so tight in the drugstore. Um, and then people were right near each other. So, but you're right. You, you, you're going to want to. So here's the thing, right? If, if your son, whether he lives with you or lives somewhere else, doesn't matter, you, you know your son, you would with a team approach. And this is, by the way, in Pennsylvania, if you look at the Pennsylvania model and Ohio model, they are looking at individuals and what's the plan for the individual. Pennsylvania is heavily that way. In, in Ohio, they actually have provider assurances for the new normal. They have enough PP that they have. If you go online, uh, the organization Anchor had put out something on this um, and, and we were able to get it through some of my colleagues, some of this information. And so, you know, what will the provider do in terms of make sure your son has gloves, you know, mask in the beginning, you know, what will, what is the uh, spacing between individuals? Will people, oh, I'm expecting people will get their temperature checked when they come to work that day. Okay, so um, I realize that's not foolproof, right? Because people could be asymptomatic but I think that those are the kinds of safeguards they'll have. And at some point, Bill Gates, the famous Bill Gates had been saying, hey, you know, we really need these Q-tip things to test aren't that expensive. If we could get them really mass produced, people could even check themselves at home before they go out. I mean, there really should be some level. That's, that's, that would like talk about reducing expense, having a lot of that available to the point where we all could use it would make life a lot more bearable. And we know we don't have it. We can go out. We know the person we're next to doesn't have it. A little more, um, what do you call it? 
peace of mind. Also, washing our hands continually is a big issue. So, um, I don't know about you. I've, you know, my hands aren't that dry. I've been using cream, but I, I wash them quite a few times a day when I when I'm out in the public. Um, I wonder if I could put Mike Mike Maloney. I know you're on. Unless you just yeah, have, Leo, uh, just make, let me make a comment about that. I just listened to the Attorney General. Yep. And any business or any program is going to have to sign an at attestation. Yep. That they've complied. So I think for somebody going into supported employment, that workplace is going to have to comply with standards and do an att attestation. You know, it's not going to be arbitrary. So we support about 200 people in employment. And some locations are going to be, are okay right now. Others may not be okay for quite a while until different phases happen. There was also a question here about- Well, second, and Mike, I just want to introduce you formally. Mike is oh. the CEO of HMEA, an uh, organization that is in, primarily in Central Mass, but relatively large organization that also does some other pretty cool things, including um, IT for us. <laughs> it's, yep, yep, it's yep. Our IT partner. And they also have a great um, elevator, this group called the Consortium, which is trying to get data track data in terms of what are the best practices for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So anyway, thank you. And you were going to answer another question, Mike. You were going to touch yeah, on. No, I just want to, wanted to mention about opening of day have. I saw in the reports, I've read different things in the stream here, that yeah. that's uh, phase two and or three. But I think what's going to happen, of course, is that these standards are um, going to be applied, but then Mass Health will interpret them. They'll let us know what they have have to look like. DDS has a media a coordinating council, so people are going to get together within the state. Um, but let me say it's extremely complex to figure out um, our day habilitation programs. We have big buildings, but there might be 60 people. And um, I saw the question earlier. We are absolutely going to have to stagger people. Um, it's really daunting. You're looking at safety, disinfecting, social distancing, not sharing anything. Uh, people maybe who have some behavioral issues. So we have groups working on that. We have a school with 26 kids and that in that small school, it's going to be very challenging to reopen. So it's like this a gigantic puzzle where the ramifications for making wrong decisions are high. And you're absolutely right about transportation. You know, how do we get people there? So, um, you know, we're working seven days a week on, on, on reopening issues. Yes, yeah, a very interesting time. I, one of the things I want to comment on, the first, you know, it's only been nine weeks now, by the way. And the first three or four weeks, people were in hyperdrive. It was an intensity, in almost living on adrenaline. The last week and a half, I'd say, there's almost been a depressive quality. And I don't mean people <laughs> are depressed. Yeah. You know what I'm saying, right, Mike? It's more yeah. like, okay, oh my God, you know, there, it's almost like a recognition of how tough it's still going to be, right? That's right. It's no longer um, reactive. Now we're really going to have to use our brains and get planful, but we don't have enough information to be planful, you know, to be planning. And how about the money part, Michael? You want to how can yeah, you, so I think how can you, you know if you don't know what your funding is. And the California thing, I'm, I'm I uh, unfortunately the screen doesn't allow me to go back and forth to my PDF or my web, or I'd be sharing with people. So the, California, I know their budget's about two hundred three billion. They're going to be nineteen billion short, right. and that even though it's got a big budget, they're looking at not having the money to do what they need to do for the the disease. Uh, so in this state, we know we're four to six billion dollars short. So Leo, HMEA, like a lot of other organizations, is looking at really big deficits. We're looking at 50 percent in, in uh, employment reimbursement is all we're getting. July 1st, July 1st is totally unclear. We're going to have to continue to serve people during the day in our residences as day programs open up or they open up partially. Um, some services like in-home ABA are very challenging. You know, sending a staff person into the home of a family, it's not a controlled environment, you know, so um, the financial implications of this are enormous for the field and we're gonna need a ton of advocacy. And we're not gonna know right. until late in the year what money we're gonna have from the legislature because of the budget. And meanwhile, 
we don't, you know, we were talking about this smaller safety net earlier too, with the 10,000 people in residential, I don't know, about 12,000 in day, 8,000, no, 11,000 now in day habilitation. Um, some of that is duplicate count between the day and so, you know, in the day hab and the day in employment. But how about people at home who don't have ABA anymore? How about people at home who don't have enough PCA, never did? Um, so we've also got this growing concern and growing stress at home and um, for people. And I want to show you guys, if I go further on the chart here before we, because it is 1230 and I want to respect the time, um, just the after effects. Here we are talking about planning and Michael, you did a great job touching on that. But I want to um, also, it's not just the time for planning, the planning's critical. And I should have another picture there, but I never changed that picture. Um, but what about the after effects of the crisis? I talked about for people like me who've had it easier than someone living and embedded in a home or easier than even Michael Maloney, who's, you know, looking at big deficits and, and not that we won't be either, but it's a whole different ballgame when you're trying to figure out staffing in homes and day programs. Look at the caregiver impact, the stress, the anxiety, working beyond normal limits. And yeah, the word trauma, the T word. Um, this is like a major event, like Hurricane Katrina, 9-11, um, major recession, except it's worse than that because most of us weren't touched personally by 9-11, right? Might have been touched by the marathon personally. Um, but here's something we've all been touched with. And, our, and staff and family members and people with disabilities have been put the deaths that have happened to people they know, the deaths that we haven't been able to memorialize. And as the crisis ebbs, we really need to recognize each other's needs for support. And people, we won't be able to support people with disabilities who can't express themselves or seek out support if we're not feeling together ourselves as staff and caregivers. And I'm really worried about that piece of it. And it really came to me through a meeting of the Friends Project, um, Pathway to Friends Widening the Circle, um, where we have a partnership with DDS to help people get social inclusion, but people were sharing the extensiveness of how exhausted, drained, and a sense of trauma that people were experiencing. And so trauma-informed care, they introduced the, the concept that we really need to start building that in, not only for our own team, but then how do we help not everyone, constituents, uh, staff, so they can be supportive of the people they support, and family members as well, because we're all feeling, we're not sure sometimes what we're feeling because we're blocking out to go on to the next day. So um, I just wanted to touch on that as well. Any other questions, Carrie? before I, uh... so stay tuned for more on this and hopefully a, a speaker on this topic. Yeah, um, so there was a question from Deborah and um, you know, just concerned about if her daughter's uh, day program opens up, but she's not able to return, what will happen? Uh, she hired someone from the day program to help out at home. So if that staff person returns to work, I lose my home staff person, and Matt right. Self gave me six extra hours of PCA support uh, that they need to stay in her home. So uh, just any thoughts on that, how to juggle all of that? Well, this is a great example, though, Deborah's. That's exactly, uh, if you think about the families, there's two core groups of families. Uh, obviously, there's the people like Deborah, whether they have a youth or an adult at home, who've been, you know, trying to juggle that. And she was one of the fortunate ones that was able to recruit a staff person that she knew there'd be consistency and infection control in her home so she and her husband could work. I mean, that was, you know, as bad as this was, she's like, in my, like in my case, you know, regardless of how tough it was, feeling like, oh, okay, I'm fortunate that I have this support system. So, so there's folks like this that I think will be going through, um, I, I think it's a negotiation piece. I think that's where you talk to wherever she or he is working and you try to almost try to negotiate a phase down piece while you try to recruit someone else that can be at the home for part of the time. Um, I, th I think that's what we're gonna be facing. And then there's people at home who haven't been as fortunate as Deborah, who are at their wits end right now because of behavioral or other issues. 
And so we're all going to, you know, we need to advocate a little more for this. I feel like that we've not failed in this advocacy, but we haven't been hurt as much in this advocacy, this piece of it. Um, and I think it's because of how bad the deficit is, quite honestly, that people felt, okay, we'll just deal with it on an emergency basis or with what tools we have, which have been family support stipends or expanding PCA or offering home health as an option. So um, maybe there's someone that could be hired by a home health agency. If they can't be hired through the PCA that you trust. Um, but I, I agree with you, you, you are gonna face, I don't think it's a simple answer to your question. That was my long answer <laughs> to, I think what's gonna be complicated over the next several weeks uh, or months. But I think the day yeah. program isn't opening up anytime soon as Mike, Michael implied. Um, however, it, when that does happen, there will be this phased confusion and you, you people will really need to, you know, folks like Deborah will need to think through, okay, let me talk to the provider first, see how much time I have so-and-so for, and then let me figure out who's out there. And remember, people are out of work. They're, you know, there could be some really cool people out there that need training, don't get me wrong. And that's where agencies like Michael's and Chapters of the Ark can really play a role if someone has the bandwidth, because you're doing agency for your own staff training, I mean. Is there a way to do some rapid training, prep training, onboarding training, so then families can hire people? And you're going to be looking to hire people too, but you're also going to be looking at deficits, which means you're going to have to have new staffing patterns at agencies. It's sort of going to be a really you know, tough transition period. And again, we yeah. still also want to deal with the post crisis feelings and trauma and, and support needs of staff as well, in addition to the constituents. Okay, thanks Leo. She did follow up, Deborah, and um, she's just concerned that uh, will Mass Health still give her the hours, even if the day program is um, opened up, it, that may not be full time. So just worried about losing so, home PCA so hours. Let's, let's get that on our list to advocate. That might be one we could win you know, for a phase down period, you know? So that's, that's something, Carrie, could we put that on our list, the specific point of transition yep. funding? Yeah. Any, anybody, right. any other questions? So this is Mike again. I just want to make one point and I know you're going through this, but, and I'm only doing this, be, uh, mentioning this because we had our virtual event yesterday, our 5K. How did it go? Well, we normally, um, net 180,000 and this year we netted 80,000. So wow. I, I think a lot of providers are going to see that, you know, I, uh, for us, that's a hundred thousand dollars that we don't have. Now, can I ask you a stupid? Oh, so you actually net 180. We normally net 180. Wow. This year we wow. net 100. Wow. And our autism center is usually up over a hundred and they're going to be in the 40 to 50 range. So taking a, whatever, $150,000 hit on, on walks. Right. And, and you know, what's interesting about that is um, I saw a Trinity College thing that's in Hartford. Um, I almost went there for college. A friend of mine did go there for college and former Senate chair Birmingham went there for college. But anyway, that school, they started a fundraiser of 5Ks, even walking to raise money for the local hospital. So, um, but I think when you have an established event, right? And you have established sponsors, right? And I think your timing, it was yesterday, Michael? Yeah, yep. yeah and Charles River Center had their event a few weeks, was scheduled in late May for their, or mid-May, um, maybe even, actually it was May, I'm, I'm making up mid-May, might have even been early May. But I think any events from April on, say late April on where sponsorships had been, you know, not delayed, but might not have been received yet, I, it is a big deal. So, so nonprofits like yours, chapters and HMEA, and uh, even ones that have their event in the fall, I think they call us their event in the fall. Um, I think that's I'm trying to remember when Northeast has their event. But anyway, bottom line is any, any events between April and the winter, organizations, nonprofits serving people with disabilities, they need the donations and help more than ever right now. And to be sort of losing on the public end and then losing on the private end is really a double hit. So um, we encourage, you know, it's one of the things, uh, you know, obviously we're always encouraging people to give to us, but you know, we really want to encourage people to give to the organizations that serve their son and daughter and um, brother and sister, uncle, you know, you name it, because 
it'll, it'll, it makes a difference in terms of the capacity right now. We want to keep a vibrant network of support. And uh, this, this day thing is a really problem on the public end, but it's, it's obviously a problem on the private end when you have a walk or an event that, that struggles, you know, to, to be that far off. In fact, in the coming year, uh, consistent with what happened to you, we're estimating a downturn of, of more than 100,000 in, in money. So I, I don't even want to say how big it is, but it, it is what it is. And trying to figure out basically, you know, how to be creative around that and looking at other revenue sources so we can keep, you know, a vibrant team. But I would say for people who serve people, um, it's really important to keep your agency in mind. And whether it's a day provider, group home provider, family support provider. So, um, yeah, that was, that's tough. Thank you for bringing that up too. I think it's important for us to share this with everybody. Okay, so if there's no, um, I think it's, I went over time. I've been so good at these, sticking to a half hour. Um, I'm gonna, you know, bring it to close now, Carrie, and just remind people uh, for the coming week, um, the, you're on tomorrow at 11. Do you have anybody on with you tomorrow? Yes, we're going to, um, we feature uh, different families and Diane Huggin is going to be sharing what, a day in her life throughout COVID-19. That's great. I'll have to tune in for that. And, and Thursday, got a little competition because Carrie will be on with Work Without Limits and DLC on the Josh Cutler KCON feed. Uh, through Facebook and down in that neck of the woods in Southeast uh, on the PAC TV. That'll be at 1030. And then Maura will have something pretty interesting. Last week, she had Representative Santiago, who's a great healthcare provider and pretty vibrant session. Um, I'm sure she's got something up her sleeve and maybe we'll start hitting the drums, banging the drums for advocacy and funding the state budget. Um, I do have, I've put something novel out there for consideration that might require a change in the state constitution. But uh, I think a situation like this warrants something novel given it's a novel situation. Um, so hoping to bring that out public down the road soon unless people tell me to knock it off. Um, and then Fridays at 12 noon, we've got Ellen Taverna doing the federal update. Uh, and this week, let, did she have last week, uh, Rep McGovern's aid on and this week, and she has someone else. Yes, yeah, that, that was last week. That was last Friday. So in rep, uh, you know, before that, she had Rep Neal, the powerful chair, uh, her, his aide, who's the powerful chair of Ways and Means at the federal level. So we've been trying to cover different areas each, each day of the week, usually giving you Wednesdays off, not all the time, um, and hopefully some special trainings. I want to encourage you to look at the crisis and leadership session that uh, Brian Cusack did. It's, former head of health industry at Google, um, just recently stepped down from that, retired, and is consulting to big health, health organizations and for us as a board member. And then we also had that lovely presentation and art that you had lined up, um, and I'm spacing out on his name. But, um, uh, Scott Better. Scott Better, and there's other ones. And then, of course, agencies might have things open that are doing virtual training for people to look at too. So anyway, hope you guys, thank you for joining us again this week. Um, really appreciate it. Uh, but also more importantly, we want to be of service to you. So if there's topics or issues or whatever that you want us to cover, please let us know. I'm really pumped. Uh, we're going to get pumped to advocate, uh, but we also got to make sure we self care and all of you out there take care of yourselves, uh, not just health wise, completely wise and um, look forward to seeing you on the other side. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you.